four trillion dollar U.S. Uh, health system is uh, deeply, deeply broken. Israel has a socialized medical system. National health systems globally fail. And the government is actually giving access to that information to healthcare innovators. From 3.01 p.m., they become entrepreneurs. We reduce readmissions. It's time to end the meeting. Investors like me who tell them, uh, oh no, you can't do that. They think if they build something great and wonderful, people will want it. And those are the companies that I want to invest in. This is a moment to think big. Hi, everyone. This is our new episode of Digital Health Interviews. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, to welcome not one, but two guests today. Um, here is Leva Shapiro and Ali Hansen. Hi, guys. Shalom. Hi there. Uh, usually, we start our interviews uh, by asking our guests to give us a short introduction, and today is no exception. So who wants to go first? I guess I want to go first. I am thrilled. Thank you, Alex, for the intro the invitation and the introduction. And I'm really delighted to be here with my good friend, Ellie Hansen, whom I've known for quite a long time. Uh, I am an American Israeli and uh, created a nonprofit for all of the Israeli digital health startup companies. It's called M Health Israel. M Health Israel has about 9,000 members in Israel, very active with um, at least one educational event per month. Uh, helping Israeli companies go global, helping global companies connect with uh, Israel. Uh, I'm also leading a digital health program uh, in uh, the Hebrew University. Uh, and I have a venture fund, Pragmata Venture Capital, uh, which is focused on biotech, medtech, digital health, and healthcare adjacent. Very interesting. Thank you. Ellie? Thanks for having me today. Um, I'm Ellie Hansen. I'm passionate about health and tech. I've been in marketing communications for almost 15 years, and I've worked with a wide variety of companies from early startups to mid-stage companies to publicly traded companies. And today, me and my team even work with a global top 10 hospital, Sheba Medical Center, uh, which is really, really leading the world in, in health tech and digital tech innovation. Um, in my role at Finn, I specialize in helping Israeli health innovators uh, communicate their stories to the world uh, and helping them not only achieve a vis visibility, but establishing a voice. Um, you can hear from my accent that even though I live in Israel, I was raised in the US, uh, in the South, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and I, I bring a unique perspective as an American here in Israel. Um, and in addition to all of my professional responsibilities, I'm also a mom of four. So life is quite busy. Nice. Thank you. And thank you for, for a short introduction, because I'm sure you could talk for, for much longer, because you have such an impressive background, both of you. Uh, my first question, since still you work both in, in the Israeli market and digital healthcare, could you just give us a short overview of what's going on? Uh, do you see that rapid increase of startups appearing in the market and lots of funds uh, caused by the pandemic in Israel right now? Uh, I'll get started. The, um, uh, so I'm tracking some of the data. Uh, the number of companies founded has been rising for about the last 10 years. Um, and the funding has risen about 7x over the last 10 years, particularly uh, the pandemic was an aberration um, and really represented a trigger in terms of new innovation and investment. So um, historically here in Israel, uh, we're very much IT oriented. We always had a device uh, community, always in medical, uh, but more recently with different um, technology or regulatory triggers, the, the community caught up. So 3G brought on quite a bit of telehealth and then the Affordable Care Act saw companies like health information exchanges, electronic health records, uh, maybe five or seven years ago, we saw quite a bit of startup momentum and activity around the cloud. And then it was about to really sort of plateau when COVID came along and represents a completely new, let's say, trigger. Uh, so companies from re remote patient monitoring, telehealth, um, these companies just really, really uh, were successful in fundraising during that period and exits. 
Um, so uh, publicly listed companies like American Well, founded by two Israelis, um, they essentially were not planning to raise money. The pandemic came, they raised 100 million, still not planning to raise money. They went public because the timing was right. Lots and lots of um, uh, companies in those subsectors. More recently, uh, we still continue to see an increase in the number of companies. Uh, by my count, 638 uh, Israeli digital health companies, around 600 med tech, around 400 biotech. Um, but we have seen that compared to the last two years, there's a little bit less capital available. And the amount of time in between rounds is extending. So it's taking longer to raise that B round. Um, and the valuations we saw even a year ago, not so easy now. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Ellie, would you like to add anything? I want to add also that over the last decade, uh, we've seen 150 companies established every year on average, and about half of those companies are still active. We know not all of them actually succeed. Um, some of the stats that I've come across recently uh, show that uh, in 2021, Israeli digital health companies raised $1.9 billion, which was more than doubled the previous year. One more thing related to COVID, to what Levy was saying, um, and obviously uh, Israel was, was, was really a chance for Israel to shine uh, in terms of bringing these digital health technologies that have been in development for quite some time and bringing them to the forefront when the world demanded these technologies. So that was a really big turning point uh, for Israeli digital health uh, and, and the world pay attention. Very cool. Uh, in 2022, do you see the, 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 it's still going on, this, this uh, trend? I think it's just going to continue to increase. We are seeing more investment, both from Israeli investors and from foreign investors in Israeli enterprises. So I think the numbers are going to continue to grow. There's um, new triggers. So the pandemic trigger definitely ushered in a wave of investment focused on a narrow subset of health tech. Uh, I think it also created a new trigger, specifically health systems, national health systems globally failed. Some failed spectacularly like the United States, some failed uh, and succeeded simultaneously like the UK. But I think what the world is demanding and is willing to pay a premium for is transformational, foundational, systemic health system change. Uh, so companies that are undertaking a real fundamental change solving the holistic problem, these companies will, uh, I think, be very much in demand. Um, same thing for solving really big problems. We learned it's not so easy to develop a, a vaccine or a new drug in a condensed period of time. So things like AI for pharma have really seen uh, a lot of uh, talent and investment more so than three or four years ago. And then the last thing I'll point out in terms of where the money is starting to shift is uh, the internet of biological things. So um, taking a variety of interdisciplinary skill sets and combining that with biology for diagnostics and treatment, a lot of opportunity there. And uh, you know, the companies that are moving in that direction will find that funding is actually still available. Companies doing things from, let's say the last cloud trigger um, maybe not so easy to, to sort of differentiate and raise follow-on funding. Very interesting. Uh, we might get back to trends a little bit later, uh, but you mentioned that some countries failed uh, with their health system and COVID showed that um, really, really well. Uh, I want to talk about the government of, the, of Israel. Uh, I know that government support, supports digital health startups a lot by giving out grants and all kinds of support. Uh, first of all, do you agree with this statement? And uh, do you know uh, Israeli health startups that got successful thanks to governmental support? I can start on this. Uh, the government is certainly supportive and they've consistently promoted healthcare innovation and invested a lot into the sector. So first of all, taking a step back, it's important to understand um, you know, the ecosystem here. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more deeply. But Israel is really unparalleled when it comes to health analytics. So the company started digitizing the population's healthcare records 25 years ago. So you have a vast amount of information and the government is actually giving access to that information to healthcare innovators. 
In fact, just uh, about two weeks ago, uh, there was an announcement that Israel approved a $30 million digital health initiative to share anonymized, anonymized medical data with startups. So, I mean, this is just an incredible opportunity that giving access to this kind of data just creates so many opportunities for, for healthcare innovators. Um, and then on top of that, you know, Israel's emphasis on higher education and research and development, and the fact that we have a very entrepreneurial spirit and world-class academic institutions, all of this creates uh, you know, a very, um, you know, a very cohesive and, and conducive environment to healthcare innovation. Um, and then added to that, the fact that we're such a small country, everybody knows everyone, uh, you know, there's, there's so much potential that, that can be tapped. Um, and Levy, I know that you have, uh, you have more to add on this and probably some examples to share as well. Government can play a positive role um, in many countries. The government in Israel um, has a number of programs to subsidize R&D. From an investment side, it's a market failure in terms of attracting investment to R&D stage technology. So one of the programs here that's working quite well is matching funds for productizing R&D stage research. Um, and that's been terrific and it de-risks the investment process for angels so um, often this is matching funds, so 50-50, half from the government, half from the private sector. Um, that's useful. There's also, Ellie mentioned the fact that we've been sitting on this repository of historical data for uh, the better part of uh, two and a half decades, but only very recently were there, let's say, was, was an infrastructure available for startups to license that data, integrate that data, um, and differentiate their product using that data. And so the government has played catch up, but done a good job of incentivizing some of the public sector to uh, participate with startups in that transformation. There's budget available for uh, HMOs, which are uh, essentially uh, cooperatives that serve as a healthcare delivery layer in between the ministry and the patients. Uh, there's budget available for um, the hospitals to uh, deploy pilots. Uh, all of this is very useful and it enables local startup companies to access two things that are much more expensive than many other markets. One is capital and two is access to beta sites or POCs, proof of concepts. That's very available as well. So by the time Israeli companies uh, reach product stage, many of them already have a little bit of funding, they have a product, they have some evidence. Um, that's a lot easier as a proposition to raise a seed round than a company that's uh, somewhere else and struggling to get that kind of information. Wow, thanks, that's amazing. Like, uh, but this, this question might be really abstract and complicated, but Lots of startup founders in digital health from other countries, they would listen to what both of you said and like, oh, I wish our country would do the same thing. Is mm -hmm. there any recommendations how to get that level of collaboration between startups and governments in other countries? That's the million dollar question. <laughs> well, one of the things that startups um, need to do is make themselves attractive to government as a, uh, as a partner. So you know, a very basic is to ensure the intellectual property is registered in your home country. Uh, that immediately suggests that there could be a whole family and suite of patents built on top of that. Um, there are very generous grant programs in a variety of um, uh, OECD countries, especially Europe. Um, also working with the local ministries of health, very important because um, it's basically the public sector. And so even if um, the money is not available as a grant, it may be available in terms of a pilot or some kind of project or tender. Um, I think that's a good start. Hire locally. Um, there's some very, very generous programs. Israel is not the only country that is um, supporting R&D stage productization. Singapore is, is extremely generous. Uh, Northern Europe has a lot of good programs. The EU has a lot of good programs. Uh, the key is, I think, um, identify your intellectual property with your local market, which makes you a meaningful, uh, perhaps, investment recipient. 
Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit uh, about legislation since we've talked a little bit about government. Uh, in the US, there's HIPAA compliance for security standards for software. There is FDA to approve uh, drugs and medical devices. What are the analogs for that in Israel? So this is not my area of expertise, but I can tell you kind of in a nutshell um, that gaining access to the Israeli market for a medical device requires registering the device with the Israeli Ministry of Health. It's called MR certification. And that's largely based on having prior approval uh, in one of the five founding GHTF countries. Um, there's a preference for already being, you know, um, going through FDA clearance in the US, that's number one. But then of course there's Australia, Canada, Europe, and Japan. And if you've already obtained approval for a device in one of those markets, you can leverage that and, and have fairly easy approval uh, within Israel. Um, that's kind of the very basic level. There are some devices that need more testing um, depending on what it is. The biggest change that I've seen in terms of regulation is unrelated to uh, standards, but actually is related to uh, investment. So last year, the Israeli government incentivized institutional capital uh, to invest in funds uh, and even to make direct investments in companies. Historically, that has been a very unattractive target for institutional investors because the country's economy is already heavily skewed towards technology. 52% of export revenue comes from uh, uh, technology. So banks and pension funds are less excited about putting more money into technology. Um, the good news is last year, we saw something like a 650% increase in institutional capital devoted to early stage investment, mostly fund to funds, but also direct investments uh, because the incentives are, are there. That's a really big, big uh, improvement. Um, and so a whole pool of capital that wasn't available suddenly shifted. So that's, I mean, that's the real regulatory news, I think, from our side. Okay. Uh, maybe any other similarities or differences between healthcare system in America and Israel? Yeah, well, there are a lot. I mean, Israel has a socialized medical system. So, I mean, complete opposite of, of the U.S. And here, everyone's required to register for insurance, and we have four, you know, health insurance providers, and people tend to stick with those providers from the time that they're young till till the time that they're old. Um, GDP, you know, spending for healthcare in Israel is about half the cost of the U.S. Um, so again, those are just kind of the basic differences. Um, you know, Israel is becoming an emerging center for, for medical tourism, which is also a unique angle to explore. Um, but one of the things that I think is very unique uh, about the Israeli healthcare system is that healthcare really unites all the sectors in Israel. Um, you know, hospitals are treating people from all backgrounds, Jewish, Arab, Muslim, Christian, Druze. And, and I think that there's something very special about that um, that I think uh, might surprise some of your listeners. Sure. Lavi, do you want to add anything? Well, if anyone um, believes that the Israeli and U.S. system uh, health systems are the same, I am very sorry to inform you they're quite, quite different. Uh, Israel is a single payer system like most of the OECD, um, but even there, it, uh, it, it's differentiated from, um, for example, the NHS. In Israel, 25 percent, we have universal health coverage, but 25 percent of the population uses private insurance. Uh, in the UK, it's about 7%. So as a result, there's, a, um, there's an innate sort of competitive dynamic that encourages um, competition based on service and innovation, which is quite good. Uh, a good example, um, physicians here are basically uh, public, service, public servants. And they're expected to work from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. They may go into the OR, do their business. From 3.01 p.m., they become entrepreneurs. And so the benefit for someone on the startup side is um, there's a very, very large pool of medical advisory board or potential chief medical officer targets. Um, and for those individual doctors or, and their families and spouses, there's a great opportunity to find um, supplementary income. So I'll give you an example. Um, many doctors 
once a week, we'll hold a private clinic at uh, convenient hours in a convenient location, something like 4 to 10 p.m. Those doctors will make more money in that one evening clinic than an entire month of their salary as a public servant. And everybody's happy. Everybody's thrilled because uh, there's an added level of convenience, uh, an added level of availability. Uh, and so there is a very nice focus on um, public and private offering. I, I guess one other major difference between the US in particular and Israel, um, the US is just full of specialists. Uh, if you were to call my doctors, uh, my orthopedist would know a thing about my uh, ENT history who may not know a thing about um, my cardiologist and, and, and that history. Uh, in Israel, everything is funneled through the general practitioner, which really helps. Ellie talked about keeping costs down. Um, a lot of hospitalization is um, unnecessary based on um, short-term symptoms. Having that individual with a holistic understanding of each patient really reduces hospitalizations, which uh, at least in the United States is the number three cause of death, hospital acquired infections. So um, there's a gazillion more differences between these two systems. Fundamentally, um, a, a single payer system that also uses the private sector uh, in order to compete on uh, service. Also, just to add to that, as a consumer of healthcare services, as a patient, I think, you know, we talked about uh, having the whole system digitized. So whether I go to a clinic within my HMO, you know, in Tel Aviv, or I'm down south in a lot, you know, three hours drive away, they can all access my files. So it's all connected. And, and that's something very unique in Israel. Um, and, and I would hope eventually in the U.S. we'll, we'll get better at, at, you know, creating a more unified uh, system. Um, but that's definitely a unique advantage here. There is a stereotype that uh, the digital health startups that appear in Israel or any other markets, uh, at some point, they still are planning to expand to American market. Uh, first of all, would you agree with that? And do you know any Israeli startups that were created specifically for Israeli market with no plan to expand? I'll say that Israel is definitely a wonderful testing ground for technologies because for all of the reasons that we talked about, but nearly every company that I work with has its eyes on the US or external markets. Those are where you know, the markets are, that is where the opportunities are. Um, so nearly every company that I've worked with You know, the innovation, the, you know, entrepreneurial spirit is here, um, but they're focused on selling abroad. So 52% of global health spend is in the United States. Uh, as an investor, I would be very um, shocked if a company approached me and said they're going to ignore 52% of the market. Um, outside of health, Israel technology historically looks towards the U.S., finds funding from the U.S., achieves exits in the United States. Um, so there are Israeli companies that grew organically, built a market, who then decided to transition into becoming global uh, companies. They haven't been very successful, right? I mean, the local EHR version is a great service and value for the Israeli um, population. It works just fine, but the company has had very little success outside of a few uh, Eastern European markets in terms of global expansion. So um, there's many companies, earlier Alex, you asked about um, Israeli uh, regulatory bodies, et cetera. Most of the companies are not even doing and pursuing uh, Israeli uh, regulatory approval because their resources and funding and talent is oriented towards the United States, and if not the United States, Europe. Uh, I would argue, given the ability to do pilots here with hospitals and HMOs, many Israeli companies are best positioned to first go to Europe. And very few do because of uh, investors like me who tell them, uh, oh no, you can't do that. That's actually interesting, Levy, because I found that many of the companies we work with go to Europe first because the approvals are a little bit a little bit more lenient than the U.S., uh, although it depends on the exact industry. 
Um, but often we'll see them, you know, pursuing clearance or you know regulatory approvals in in Europe and then the U.S. Yeah, but the things are constantly changing. Agreed. The, uh, the good ones understand that um, expenses are lower. Um, indirect sales channel is um, a more attractive option for Europe. Uh, a company like MetaSense, MetaSense quantitatively, objectively measures pain, and they do that in the OR. They're trying to uh, seg into the ICU. They had uh, CE for probably the better part of the last eight years, and they're just getting FDA. So there's there are companies that have done that, the uh, Europe first approach, but most, really most, and particularly in digital, are 100% focused on the United States. Also to add, we're, we're having a growing number of companies also interested in Japan and in you know, the Asian market. So again, depending on the exact sector, obviously they have a large population and, and have very specific needs, but that's also really a growing area that I've seen a focus for Israeli companies. Thanks. I think both of you mentioned several really important, useful statements for our audience, for startup founders, and hopefully they're going to listen to them. Uh, I wanted to, to talk a little bit about the promotion and marketing for digital health startups. Al, you've been in this field for many, many years. Um, could you tell us uh, when do you think a startup founder should start thinking about marketing strategy? Because, you know, like lots of startup founders, they, they think like, let's do, the, let's do the prototype first or MVP version, let's test it, talk to target audience. And may, maybe if everything works out well, maybe then we should start thinking about marketing. Do you think that's, that's a good strategy or bad strategy? So marketing strategy really needs to be part of the discussion from the very beginning. So one of the common errors that I see among passionate entrepreneurs, they think if they build something great and wonderful, people will want it. Uh, but it's more complicated than that. We all know that. So you have a great design, but you need to really understand how your solution fits into the market um, and make sure that that innovation can actually be implemented, right? So first is addressing a real need. And then it's, well, how do you communicate that, right? So again, from the very beginning, and it's more than just creating visibility, it's creating an identity and a voice to make sure that the market understands what you're doing and why they need what you're doing. Um, I'll say that one of the pet peeves I have when it comes to marketing strategy is, you know, a founder of a startup will come to me and they'll say, guess what, we're raising, you know, series, whatever it is, and we, we're going to go out with it next week, how can you help me? And I'm like, wow, that's great, but the foundations of a good marketing strategy need to, you know, you need preparation time, right? You need to build, build the foundation. Who are you? What are you trying to achieve? And how do you say that in a compelling way? And, and you'd be surprised even among, um, you know, startup co-founders, there's sometimes dis disagreements on how, how, you know, you should present yourself. And it's crucial that everyone be aligned before you go out and you start saying all these things. And then that message, that, that voice needs to be conveyed you know, in a unified way throughout all your communication. So in short, Alex, it, it really needs to be part of the conversations very early on and not just a week before, hey, we're doing this. Good, I think that's important. Uh, can you tell us what are the channels that are most appropriate right now for digital health startups for promotion? I feel like I could do a whole podcast just on marketing strategies. So but I'll try to keep it very, very simple. Um, first of all, another pet peeve, uh, PR, you know, um, public relations does not stand for press release. There are many, many tools that we and, and you know, entrepreneurs should, should, you know, use to create a compelling marketing strategy. The other caveat before I get into some more details is that you can't build a strategy on PR alone. If you're counting on just getting articles, uh, you're going to fail because if PR is a vacuum without you know, all of these other uh, critical elements, uh, you're, you're not going to get to where you need. So let's kind of break down, I think, the key elements, and I'll try to keep it concise for your, for your uh, audience. But the first part is planning. Uh, a mentor of mine, uh, Gil Bash, who you've had on the show previously, uh, famously has said to me, and I love this quote, if you don't know where you're going, any road is going to take you there. So the first step is establishing your goals. What do you want to accomplish? Who is your audience? Are you trying to reach consumers? Are you trying to reach healthcare decision makers, researchers? You have to understand who you're going for and what is your message, right? What is your unique offering? How does that compete with the competition? These are all fundamental questions that you have to answer before you start with all of the marketing tools. 
once you know all of these answers, then you can go to your, you know, your marketing toolkit. And you have a variety of options that, that you put together to create a sustainable campaign. So you have press releases, uh, you have interviews with media, uh, participating in podcasts, right? Alex, something that you know a lot about. Um, writing articles, writing opinion pieces. You have uh, social media, which, you know, depending on what you're trying to accomplish, which social media channels should you be active on? What should your voice be? How should you interact with others? And you have tons of uh, regulatory uh, considerations that you have to keep in mind for all of these. You know, you have peer reviewed research. Let's not forget how important that is to building credibility and evidence. Uh, you have events and awards. Again, all of these, you know, I'm kind of listing a lot of tactics, but these are all incredibly important ways that you can create visibility, create a voice, and make sure that the market knows and cares about you. I agree with you. We should do a, a separate podcast about marketing strategy for startups. Uh, that's, this has been my focus for, as you can see, this is just, you know, the tip of the iceberg, um, but, but important to understand that it's about building momentum. And it's not just one article in Forbes or one article in New York Times. It's about building steady momentum. All right. Thank you. Um, I have a small game for both of you. Uh, the rules are very simple. So one of your friends uh, just came to you yesterday and asked to help select a startup to invest in. Uh, he wants to invest $100,000. Here are four startups he's looking at. Uh, number one, a great VR application that helps patients to do exercises that should help their back pain. Number two, AI platform, which aims to find dental diseases to providers based on x-rays. Number three, a beautiful, easy to use, very helpful application to help treat mental problems. And number four, a platform for decentralized clinical trials, onboarding patients, and helping communicate with doctors. So I know in real life, it's definitely not how it works. You have to do lots of uh, research, due diligence and stuff like that. But just according to the trends on the market, which startup would you recommend your friends to invest in out of these four? Uh, first of all, I would suggest they uh, consult with their spouse because uh, angel investing is not the um, highest uh, probability of success. Uh, among that list, um, you know, my focus more than anything is timing. Um, you know, my obsession is about timing. Um, as, a, as an entrepreneur, I got into uh, technology when 3G was introduced and, and built some companies around that. When uh, I transitioned to digital media, digital health, it was really around uh, the Affordable Care Act as a trigger. So where are we in terms of timing? Um, and I would argue that the uh, spiffy, fancy application you mentioned, you know, going to be a tough moment given, um, you know, given everything we've seen in the market. For example, another one was mental health, right? Mental health, the popular apps, usage is down 60% since the pandemic. Um, Talkspace, uh, an Israeli uh, telemental health company, uh, managed to sneak through the IP window. They've lost 87% of their value since the SPAC. And so I, I wouldn't look at that timing and say, boy, that's very attractive. And so, you know, of those four, I think we're still early in the decentralized clinical trials game. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to fail forward. The 100K um, company may crash and burn, but still get, get acquired for the people. And so there still may be some potential outcome. Even that founder may go on and do something different and sort of keep you in the, uh, in the family. Uh, so that's my two cents. Really, this moment is not about um, uh, what we can do in the cloud. Uh, this is a moment to think big. And this is a moment for interdisciplinary solutions. Um, and not just some simple diagnostic. One of your examples was a, uh, a diagnostic. Well, that, that sounded like you are not doing this the first time. <laughs> Looks like you're an experienced investor. Thanks. Ellie, which one would you choose? Levy definitely is. I, to Levy's point, though, I think, you know, we see a lot of really cool ideas that focus on one specific issue. And, and sometimes they succeed and sometimes they don't. Um, my gut was telling me that the fourth, the decentralized clinical trial platform, that it's a very important space right now. You know, we saw COVID kind of, you know, demand new things with that. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity within that sector. So 
that was kind of my my gut reaction. But that being said, I think you know you have to go beyond just the idea, and you have to see you know the the business plan behind behind each of them, and really make an informed decision. Yeah, and so just to throw things uh, one more concept into the mix, um, revenue, uh, and more particularly. ROI for your customer. Most companies that, uh, you know, you can push them, you can squeeze them, you can pinch them. They really can't tell you how they're going to make money, how their customer is going to see a significant change in ROI because of their product. So if they say something like we reduce readmissions, it's time to end the meeting. Uh, If they say something like we improve quality, that's not drastically improving return on investment for your customers. Um, US health systems are somewhere they were before the pandemic at around two and a half percent margins. Uh, During the pandemic, they had a huge infusion of government cash, but now with the uh, skilled nursing labor shortages, they're losing money, they have negative margins. And so startups that can truly do the work, quantify the ROI, uh, conduct some health economics outcomes research. They've got such an advantage uh, in telling their story. And those are the companies that I want to invest in. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, in the very end, I usually ask to give some recommendations for startup founders in digital health. Uh, maybe some, um, some mistakes that you observe all the time in this, in this field that you would recommend to skip for startup founders in order to succeed. Uh, sure. So I guess I could I could um, suggest three different recommendations for founders. Um, one, and I see this a lot here in Israel, don't overfocus on gadgetry of your invention. Instead, focus on the impact that your technology will have on users and on the systems and on the marketplace. So remember, it's not just about features. It's about value and impact. Uh, two, we talked to, uh, about having a strategy. Uh, so definitely have a strategy, but also be flexible. And, and to Levy's last point, make sure that your passion and innovation actually translates into value creation and you have a sustainable business model. That's really important. Um, and three, I think surrounding yourself with the, ra- with the right partners, you need people who can really support you and be an extension of your team. Um, and again, you know, if you're located in Israel and you're targeting the U.S. market, you need people who deeply understand how to navigate the system and how to connect with the key players. And, you know, that's payers, it's policymakers, it's providers, it's patient groups. So you have to make sure that you have the right partners to help you make the impact. Parting advice for startups. Uh, Think big, go big, because the uh, $4 trillion U.S. uh, health system is uh, deeply, deeply broken. Uh, $4 trillion represents a nickel of every global GDP buck. So uh, it's nice that you can do something better, cheaper, and faster. But the real challenge is fixing a a broken system, undertaking those challenges. Um, Invest your limited resources into becoming experts in reimbursement, uh, coding, coverage, and payments. It's not one of those three items, it's all three. And it's a very uh, time consuming, expensive, deliberate process. The same way startups approach LE and talk about marketing a week before fundraising, uh, you certainly don't wanna be doing that um, from the reimbursement side. Reimbursement is the only part of uh, your projections that the the investor can really, um, let's say tangibly understand. It's just a volume game. X number of customers getting this much payment uh, will generate this much revenue. And uh, if you're not putting that effort into reimbursement and constantly tracking that, you're, you're really hurting yourself. Thank you, Levy, and thank you, Ali. Uh, I really uh, encourage everyone to subscribe to our channel and listen to all those great recommendations. I'm sure they're gonna help you make your startup succeed. Uh, that's that's all I had for today. So thank you again.